Welcome everybody and thank you for enrolling in the CVE Podcast Plus for July 2015. Uh, my name's Natasha Lees and we'll be looking at bovine anemia, jaundice and red urine. Could it be teleriosis? So we'll get started. Um, this session will cover the diagnostics and differential diagnoses of anemia, jaundice and red urine in cattle and we'll also have a closer look at teleriosis teleriosis, particularly epidemiology, the epidemiology diagnostics and management. But I have a little bit of a case study running through the, um, through the talk as we go. So if we start off with having a look at anemia, going right back to the basics, anemia is a deficiency of the number of erythrocytes and haemoglobin concentration in blood, we all know that. And it is important to remember that anemia is a clinical sign, not a diagnosis. So if we take a little bit of a closer look at the etiology. Um, again, this is a bit of a revi bit of revision. So, anemia uh, comes from the, either the loss of erythrocytes or the inadequate erythrocyte production. And if we look at the loss of erythrocytes, we can break it up into two main groups. It's either going to be caused by hemolysis or by blood loss. And coagulopathies are usually included in that uh, blood loss category. So they're generally our regenerative causes of anemia. The other causes, other main group of cause of anemia is our inadequate erythrocyte production. And so we've got um, primary and secondary bone marrow disease causing that. And that falls usually into our non-regenerative anemia category. So we have a bit of a closer look at our causes of regenerative anemia. Um, if we firstly look at, now, th now this is quite a, um, a complicated looking uh, little diagram, but it just nicely breaks it up um, for you in terms of getting some clarity of where our main causes of regenerative anemia are coming from. Um, over here on the left, uh, we've got blood loss and we can break that up into acute and chronic. Uh, and our acute commonly, we can break up into internal and external. Um, and if we look at internal causes of blood loss, we've got things like ruptured uterine artery um, or a vessel erosion due to an abscess or neoplasia or any sort of trauma that's going to cause internal bleeding. Um, if we then have a look at our external, here our external causes of blood loss, we have things like husbandry procedures. Um, Abomase loss, interestingly, is classified as a uh, external uh, cause of um, bleeding um, because it's bleeding into the gut. Uh, we've also got, of course, any cause of external external trauma, hemorrhagic jejunal syndrome and caudal vena cava syndrome. Uh, if we go over to the chronic causes of blood loss, there are things like parasitemia, so fasciolysis. Um, well, hemonchus is not common in, in cattle, but um, we do sort of keep it on the list. Uh, there's ticks, lice and even fleas, particularly in calves, um, can, can cause more of a chronic uh, blood loss. And blood loss into the gut will be accompanied um, often with a, an iron deficiency, so, so that can create a, um, a chronic blood loss. If we look at coagulopathies, well, they're not really that common in cattle, but a, a quick rundown, thrombocytopenia can be seen with BVDV and of course with our bracken fern poisoning. Uh, reduced platelet function can happen due to congenital diseases, which I will mention later. Um, we've got uh, dicormoral poisoning or rat bait poisoning. And there's a couple of breed-related um, platelet dysfunctions from factor 8 and factor 11 deficiency. And of course, um, DIC which can happen in any species. And if we, we go over to hemolysis, this is quite a big category and I've just broken it up into our intravascular hemolysis and our extravascular hemolysis. And within each of these categories, um, there are quite a number of causes of um, uh, hemolysis. And I'll, I'll go, actually, I'll give you a list of what those causes are just as an easy reference for you um, later on. So. Within the intravascular hemolysis category, we've got things like parasitemia, Heinz body anemia, bacterial infections, deficiencies and toxicities. And with extravascular, we've got parasitemia, toxicities, congenital and immune mediated. So um, that's a broad look at the causes of regenerative anemia. If we just go 
uh, funnel down into the causes of regenerative anemia um, with intravascular hemolysis. Now remember that intravascular hemolysis is associated with haemoglobinemia and haemoglobinuria. So you will see red urine associated with um, causes of intravascular hemolysis. And our common causes are red blood cell parasites like Babesia and Tularia. Um, we can have Heinz body anemias um, from onions and brassicas and um, copper toxicity. We've got bacillary haemoglobinuria and leptospirosis, that's the leptospira in Terragans cerevar pomona, which is um, really only in carbs, and deficiencies in phosphorus, um, commonly or not, not so common, but um, you know, occasionally seen as a post parturient haemoglobinuria, and toxicities of copper, water, zinc, and sporodesmond toxicity or facial eczema as it's more commonly known. One thing to be aware of is that selenium deficiency may increase the risk of hemolytic anemia associated with postparturient haemoglobinuria and kale poisoning. So um, something to bear in mind in the back of your mind when looking at um, the epidemiology behind how the um, cattle may have got um, these presenting signs. If we look at the extravascular causes, now note that there will be um, no haemoglobinemia or haemoglobinuria with extravascular hemolysis, and they're often more jaundiced than intravascular hemolysis cases. So um, we'll have a look at those. We've got um, our anaplasma and tularia, uh, as a, involved in the parasitemia, uh, lead toxicity, and these are rare but still worth mentioning because they can happen in cows, diseases, bovine congenital erythropoietic porphyria and immune mediated hemolytic anemia. So I've given you those um, sort of lists of diseases just as a reference for you to come back to uh, um, at a later stage when you come across these um, diseases and so that you've got sort of a, a go-to list of the more common ones. It's not exclusively all the things that can cause um, regenerative and, and non-regenerative anemia, but um, uh, just a, a good common list. So if we take a look at a closer look at the causes of our non-regenerative anemia in cattle, as I said before, we've got our primary bone marrow disease and we have our secondary bone marrow disease. So within our primary bone marrow disease, actually bracken fern will cause that uh, mycotoxicosis and lead toxicities can, can cause um, a primary bone marrow disease. Of course, we've got neoplasia and um, congenital dyserythropoiesis of pole herefords is also in that category. Secondary bone marrow disease, um, and look, this is the most common cause of non regenerative anemia in cattle, is actually chronic inflammatory disease. So basically, that's anything that's been going on for a long time is going to cause a, a dysfunction in the bone marrow. So um, other, I guess, more definitive things, slightly more definitive things are end-stage renal and liver failure, intestinal trichostrongolosis, um, and malnutrition, particularly of iron, copper, cobalt, and magnesium, and in New Zealand, um, that's particularly the Taranaki anemia, uh, can all cause secondary bone marrow dysfunction which will lead to regenerative anemia. So um, now that we have these sort of the basic structure of the causes of anemia and a few sort of groups of common diseases outlined, I'd like to sort of take a little bit more of a, a different look. But oh, before I do that, I want to have a look at uh, just a few points about some uh, bovine clinical pathology. So reticulocytes um, do not occur in the normal non-anemic room of blood unlike their small animal counterparts. So the presence of reticulites in a blood smear generally indicates regenerative anemia. But quantification with a reticulocyte count by a pathologist is, is still a prudent thing to do. Um, and um, in-house, unless you're really sure of what you're doing, in-house counting of, of reticulocytes can be um, a little bit tricky um, just in terms of identifying what is a reticulocyte and what isn't. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it, it, it shows that if you've got reticulocytes in your blood smear, you've got regenerative anemia. Um, 
bear in mind that you must request a reticular site count with most pathologists um, with your bovine CBC if you actually want to have a reticular site count done and that that could be important in, a, in an anemia case to um, to very quickly uh, demarcate, demarcate our differential diagnoses into um, our regenerative and non-regenerative causes of anemia and then we, we've can, we can easily remove some of the differentials from the list which is something I always like to be able to do. Um, so if you remember though that it takes two to four days for bone marrow to respond to anemia. So initially very acute anemias can look non-regenerative so you need to bear in mind that if you do not have reticulocytes um, present in the blood smear you need to think about how quickly has the animal gone downhill or how quickly since the inciting cause of anemia because if it is within that two to four day range um, you may just not have had enough time for the reticulocytes to enter into the blood stream. And also just be aware that um, in cattle RB, RBCs circulate for about 150 days so anemia is caused by a lack of erythrocyte production can be slow developing. Uh, it's that that's different to cats and dogs where it's um, the RBC circulate for, for a much lesser period of time. So if we have a look at Daisy Do and um, this is sort of a little bit of a case that will run through part of the presentation but um, if we look at the clinical presentation that's generally associated with anemia so when we go out on farm and we look at an animal aside from seeing pale mucous membranes there are some other classic um, signs that come with anemia and that's lethargy and weakness we've got tachycardia and increased intensity of the heart sounds that's in compensation of the, um, the lower red blood cells um, floating around uh, we've got increased respiratory rate and de depth again that's associated with the lack of red blood cells and the lack of oxygen being um, pumped around we have our pale mucous membranes which is generally our, our flag stuff that, that, that that's um, anemia is involved we've got also got cold extremities and generally we've also got low plasma protein um, so just moving on, where do we go from here then? We've identified that Daisy's um, got anemia and how are we going to to move from here in terms of working out what it is. So our history of course as always is important and we can easily push some differentials up or down the list if we ask the right questions. So of course a vaccination, we can look at whether clostridials or leptospirosis might be involved. Um, if we ask about drenching, could could fasciolosis, nematodes or ectoparasites be involved and um, and certainly with the ectoparasites we'd be able to see them visually on our clinical exam. Uh, we've got feed related issues so from the pasture are there plant risks such as bracken fern, brassicas and onions. Uh, in the ration that the cows are getting if they're on a, a uh, mixed ration that's um, being fed to them, uh, do we have copper and zinc content issues that uh, could be interfering um, with hemolysis there. Uh, and also we might want to be having a look at the location. Temperate regions won't have Babesia species or Anaplasma species. Uh, so we would want to have a look at signalment and periparturient cows are more um, prone to certain diseases. Of course postparturient haemoglobinuria occurs post-calving and um, Tilleria is more likely to occur in periparturient cows. And then we can even have a bit of a chat about cattle movement and introductions because our parasitemias um, are commonly involved with the introduction of animals into the herd. So our history will eliminate some of our differentials um, and perhaps shift our suspicions around. We can also have a think about the epidemiology of certain diseases. So calves are more susceptible to parasites and leptospira, interrogans pomona. Um, our periparturian cows, as mentioned before, have the postparturian hemoglobinuria and tilleria. Um, age and disease chronicity may, may suggest a bone marrow failure. Then taking into consideration breed because um, that will be associated with congenital or heritable diseases. And herd level or individual involvement. So herd outbreaks can occur with tilleriosis, babesiosis, anaplasmosis and plant toxicities. And that can also happen with um, clostridial diseases as well in unvaccinated herds. 
So processing all of that um, information in conjunction with our clinical signs is really important. So qualifying what we know about Daisy Doo, um, the history shows no access to bracken fern or lead, mycotoxins, onions, nor brassicas. Um, we've got no evidence of Molina or Frank blood. Um, so no obvious indication of bleeding into the gastrointestinal tract. Um, our temperature is sitting about 40. Uh, she is recently calved and showing signs of jaundice and has some red urine as well. An abdominocentesis um, was done and showed clear fluid. So going on from here, have a think about, I'll actually, I'll take you back to that slide. So now have a think about what you would do um, given all these signs. What would be your next step? What sorts of things are you thinking could be involved? If we have a look at our calcite options when it comes to diagnosing anemia, um, so this is thinking about it practically as you are standing there beside the crush. So urine sample obviously, well in this case it was red urine and we, we'd want to identify whether it was haemoglobinuria or haematuria and we can do that by spinning it down and examining the sediment for red blood cells. <clears throat> do be aware that if the um, if you're looking at the supernatant and it is um, red, the, uh, the red blood cells can lyse in the urine and release the haemoglobin to make it um, appear red. So just spinning it down, the urine down and looking at the supernatant is inadequate to distinguish between haemoglobinuria and haematuria. You do need to examine the sediment for red blood cells and if it's haemoglobinuria there will be no red blood cells uh, in your sediment. We can have a look at doing a faecal sample and we're looking for a cult blood because we can't actually rule out avamazole ulcer in the absence of melina. So um, there's that threshold um, from where we can visibly see um, the, the evidence of, of blood or bleeding into the gastrointestinal tract and then um, there's a level where we can't visibly see that. So a faecal sample for a cult blood um, would be an option to um, I guess more thoroughly rule, rule out of a mazel also. Um, abdominocentesis, of course, to um, just try and identify whether or not there may be internal hemorrhage in the um, abdominal, in the abdomen, sorry. Um, and what we also then, of course, want to do in this situation is get a blood sample, take some EDTJ and some serum. Um, most importantly doing a CBC and a blood smear and we can also have a look at some biochemistry. Uh, there's a thing called a fanny card. Now this has been developed from New Zealand and it's a, um, I'll show it to you later on actually, when um, particularly when we're talking about uh, telaria, but um, that can help assess the severity of anemia calcite so that you've got a bit of a rough idea how severely anemic your animal is and whether or not you may want to consider doing a blood transfusion then and there. So um, these are our, our main calcite options and then, then once we've taken our bloods and sent them off to the lab, um, of course we'd be looking at our PCB which should be 0.24 to 0.46 is the normal range for bovines. Red blood cell count. Um, red blood cell count would be um, less than five if we were concerned about it. Um, and haemoglobin normally should be between 80 and 150. And the platelet count should be 150 to 650. Now this, these parameters have come from bovine medicine. Uh, edited by Cockroft. Um, so the lab, d different labs may have different um, reference ranges. So establishing uh, the severity or firstly ruling confirming anemia um, through our CVC and also getting an indication of the severity of it is important. Uh, our plasma protein can be helpful because we can help identify relative blood loss. So a decreased PCV um, is generally um, accompanied by a normal or increased TPP in cases of hemolysis. If the TPP is decreased proportionate to the decrease in the PCV, then 
it's more likely that we've got hemorrhage happening. You do have to bear in mind though that um, it will take 24 to 48 hours after acute blood loss for abnormalities to be seen in the PCV and the TPP. Uh, so you do need to take those time frames into consideration when interpreting that ratio between plasma protein and PCV. Our biochemistry will be useful in terms of assessing for phosphorus deficiency and um, we need to do a blood smear with every sample but especially in cases of anemia so pathologists love it when we take do our blood smear at the time when we've taken the blood I know practically this may not always be possible in um, cattle practice um, but uh, it is possible to have your slides in the car and, and do a smear straight away uh, particularly if you know you're not going to be going back to the to the, the practice um, soon after the call uh, and that's the reason they like to have that blood smear is done quickly um, is because the denaturing of the, the red blood cells makes it, makes it harder for them to interpret what they're seeing. So if we go to the blood smear, the possible findings that we'd, we'd see associated with anemia, so paracetamia, the can see Tularia, Babesia and Anaplasma on a, on a blood smear. We've got Heinz bodies, now the Heinz bodies make the red blood cells more susceptible to extravascular and intravascular hemolysis and in ruminants it's often associated with phosphorus, selenium and copper deficiency, onion and brassica poisoning and copper toxicity. We'll also often see basophilic stippling but that's also seen in, in lead poisoning as well. How old jolly bodies, uh, they commonly accompany, accompany regenerative anemia, um, but it's also seen in splenic dysfunction. The other thing to be aware of is that how old jolly bodies can look like anaplasma marginale, so um, that's where we need the pathologists to um, make those interpretations for us. Of course, we'll be seeing um, reticulocytes or polychromasia in our anemic blood and nucleated red blood cells, increased MCV and decreased MCHC. So um, I've got a few slides here just to show you what those things are. If you do choose to do your own, have a look at your own blood smear um, and sort of teach yourself a little bit um, about how to interpret um, what you're seeing, we've got um, Heinz bodies uh, here in uh, in this micrograph are the Howell jolly bodies of these ones here and we've got basophilic stippling. We do have to be careful how we you know that how the untrained eye um, interprets this so um, always good to have a look at it have a look at a blood smear yourself and and send one off to the pathologist. This is just to show you the uh, Babesia anaplasma and Tularia appearance. So here we've got um, Babesia in these red blood cells. Uh, anaplasma, now this is Anaplasma marginale. Um, and uh, we've got Tularia. Okay. So you can see that if you compare, I'll go back to the, if you have a look at these bodies and I'll go back to the other slide. There's a similarity, particularly with the how jolly bodies sometimes could look a little similar to some of what we're seeing here. Okay, so moving on to jaundice. Um, what we would need to be focusing on firstly is just a quick quick revision. So the yellow coloration detected is best detected in the in the vulval mucous membranes in bovines. Um, the scleral and vulval mucous membranes will give you a much better idea um, than the mucous membranes of the mouth. Okay so we, of course we've got increased levels of bilirubin in tissue and serum hence the colour change and bovine serum bilirubin is normal at about 2 to 18 micromoles per litre. But interestingly, the tissue visibility of jaundice doesn't happen until it gets above 45 micromoles per litre. So there is a, a, a gap between um, normal bilirubin and actually visibly seeing jaundice. And as the same with anemia, jaundice is a clinical sign, not a diagnosis. Oh, a little bit of animation there, just to clarify what I'm talking about. Sorry guys, I forgot I'd done that. 
Right, so if we look at the etiology of jaundice, we've got um, prehepatic, hepatic and post-hepatic. These are all the basic things that we've been taught um, way back in vet school. So hemolysis is our prehepatic causes, particularly with extravascular um, hemolysis, we get um, a more obvious jaundice. It's going to be associated with regenerative anemia. Um, so you can, can make that correlation between um, uh, your CBC and your your visual um, or visual assessment of jaundice. Um, intravascular hemolysis will also see your hemoglobin urea or hemoglobinemia. So another way to qualify the cause of your prehepatic jaundice is again, do we have extravascular or intravascular? And our urine is one of the best ways to identify that. Um, Hepatic jaundice is caused by reduced clearance of unconjugated bilirubin or reduced excretion of conjugated bilirubin from hepatocytes to bile. And post-hepatic is generally cholestasis. Now, um, differentiating conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin can be unrewarding and is generally not done by pathologists um, these, these days because um, there's too much crossover uh, between the two. Uh, and distinguishing hepatic from post-hepatic causes um, is difficult as well as disease in, in one system can affect the other system. So, um, you know, quite often they'll both be, be elevated and it can be difficult to try and pitch one against the other when we're trying to get a definitive diagnosis. So if we have a look at our pre-hepatic causes, okay, we, we've got hemolysis and we've been through that, all of those options. Um, in our anemia discussion, so I'll, I'll keep moving on. Um, and when it comes to hepatic and post-hepatic, what I've done here is just give you, given you a list of the really common uh, causes. Um, with the hepatic causes, we've got a lot of plant-related issues, so pyrolizidine alkalides, aflatoxicosis, cottonseed lupinosis, green blue algae, photosensitization, and then, then we've got sort of more the liver associated issues of liver neoplasia, fatty liver syndrome, acute bovine liver disease, and fasciolosis is um, very, very rare in, in actually causing jaundice, but it can. Um, Post-hepatic causes, um, sporodesmond toxicity, aflatoxicosis, lantana toxicity, and sapogen and poisoning. So again, that's just a list for you to really refer back to um, when you are trying to work through all the possibilities. Let's have a look at the calcite options we've got in, in a case of jaundice. Um, again, urine is probably one of the, the key things we want to try and get to decide whether we've got haemoglobinuria or not. And a liver biopsy is something you could consider. Um, you may not do that straight away, it might be something you consider down the track, but um, we, we might consider that for copper poisoning or histopathology of primary liver disease. And um, a pasture sample, so our pithomyces chartarum spore count could be helpful in, in narrowing down the possibility of um, sporodesmond toxicity being involved. And of course a blood sample, um, our CBC biochem, copper and selenium could be helpful too in knowing um, what those levels are. We do have to be careful interpreting cop serum, copper and selenium, uh, but um, that it may be helpful in narrowing it down. So further look at diagnostics. With our haematology, we've got uh, PCV and, and red blood cell counts to assess an immune hemolysis. In our biochemistry, we can look at, of course we're going to have increased um, serum bilirubin, but we can also be looking at is phosphorus deficiency involved. GLDH increases with hepatocellular damage. Just be aware that this can increase with severe anemia and high and hepatocyte anoxia. So um, if you've got severe anemia and an increased GLDH, you need to think about whether or not you've got hepatocyte disease or just a consequence of the anemia. And, and our GGT increases with cholestasis, so any of these results could help um, send us down the right path to getting a, def a definitive diagnosis. Now I've put bile acids in here because um, it's not very commonly done um, because it's hard to truly fast a ruminant, um, but it may be useful if you've got to the point where you want your, you and your client would like to um, try and identify liver dysfunction. 
but it needs to be interpreted and, and I would suggest you have a good discussion with your pathologist um, before going ahead with that to, to get an idea of the benefits of it, given the situation that you're trying to diagnose. Um, just some insights um, that I've just found interesting. Um, significant bilirubinemia or icterus in ruminants is commonly due to hemolysis. So um, that's why you're really important as a first thing to get a urine sample because it will probably be the most common cause of jaundice. Uh, mild increases in bilirubin, bilirubin um, even up to 30 and to 34 micromoles per litre may occur in bovines with anorexia. So be careful interpreting your bilirubin levels when, they, when it's mild hyperbilirubinemia because it may just be due to not eating. Um, and there's more pronounced jaundice occurs with conjugated bilirubin, so a hepatic and post-hepatic or biliary obstructive diseases are going to create a more pronounced jaundice than unconjugated bilirubin, which is generally associated with hemolysis. So sometimes some of these things can help refine the way we're thinking uh, in terms of our, our differential options. Okay, having a closer look at red urine. Okay, so red urine, generally caused by two main things, haemoglobinuria and haematuria, but also myoglobinuria can create a reddish-brown um, appearance to the urine. Be aware that haemoglobinuria can get a little bit of a brownish look to it over time as well. Um, just a quick look at the some of the common causes of haematuria in cattle. So, of course, we've it's anything that's going to cause bleeding um, on, in the urinary tract from the kidney to the urethra. So we've got our bracken fern, uh, poly, uh, pyelonephritis, sorry, um, cystitis, not that common in, in cattle, but um, still worth having on the list of possibilities. Uh, urolithiasis, of course, more common in steers. And um, malignant catarrhal fever can actually cause hematuria, but that's in the, eye, at the head and eye form of the disease. Um, and sporodesmin toxicity. Now, it can cause hematuria due to a cystitis, and, um, but, but usually, it, if it's going to cause red urine, it's a haemoglobinuria, but it's just something to be aware of. Okay, so let's have, when we have a look at our haemoglobinuria, uh, it's basically anything that causes intravascular hemolysis causes haemoglobinuria. So this is a more pictorial form of the list of um, differentials that I had earlier uh, on in the other slides. Um, just to try and help make it easier for us all to try and think of all the possibilities. And I've I've um, I've put myoglobinuria in. It's it's pretty uncommon in cattle. It's caused by severe muscle breakdown and necrosis um, and, and giving that reddish brown urine and we'd see it potentially in exertional myopathies of downer cows or really severe nutritional myopathies of vitamin E and selenium deficiency. So it's just something just to be aware of. Um, okay, looking at the diagnostics of if we've got a case of red urine, of course our urine samples are our number one thing to get. So we want to distinguish it between hematuria and hemoglobinuria, which I explained before. We're looking for that um, RBC sediment in the urine. Uh, we could culture for cystitis or pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is often grossly visible on urine sampling, and, and um, can almost you can almost be sure just on uh, um, cow side, often what you're dealing with there. Um, but you know, always consider culture as a possibility. Um, We'd want to be having a look at cytology if we're concerned about um, urolithiasis for, and, and looking for crystals uh, in the urine. And just be aware that haemoglobinuria and myoglobinuria will come up positive for blood on a dipstick. Uh, so um, don't always interpret a positive blood dipstick as it being red blood cells. Okay, so going a little further, we're going to want to qualify our red urine a little bit, bit more beyond just our urine sample. We want to have a look at our PCV and RBC. We want to assess um, for hem hemolysis. We probably will have um, satisfied ourselves of that when we've worked out whether we've got hemoglobinuria or hematuria. 
Um, however, it's always good to get an idea of the severity of what we're dealing with. Um, again, the blood smear. Now that's going to assent, again assess if we've got a regenerative anemia and we might pick up some parasites on that blood smear as well. And again, we can consider doing a liver biopsy for copper poisoning. So, now we're going to look at tuliriosis in a bit of detail. So, um, this has become more of an issue in the last 10 years in um, Australia and it's um, because of an introduction of a more virulent strain of tuliria. So um, if we have a look at the etiology of it, tuliria orientalis is now what tuliriosis uh, is the main cause of, or the cause of tuliriosis in Australia. Um, it used to be referred to as T. buffali, T. sigenti, T. orientalis and, and was known as benign tuliriosis. It is now not necessarily benign. So we really need to get a handle on what variant of tuliria, tuliria orientalis we're talking about. So Australia has three genotypes of tuliria orientalis and those genotypes um, of those genotypes, we have three major ones, and um, there's they're actually cl classified based on their major pyroplasm surface proteins. So um, those three main ones have been given a taxonomic name, and we have buffali, which is considered benign or avirulent. And we've probably had that. Well, we, it's been confirmed to be in the country since the 1980s. It's possibly been here since before then. Um, and then the other variant is Chitose. Now, that is possibly associated with clinical disease, but it's often in mixed infections with buffali um, or Akita. And that was um, identified in 2003. And the um, Akita variant is the one that is consistently associated with clinical disease. And that was diagnosed um, or identified in 2006. So, well first, I don't know whether it was actually definitively identified, but it was certainly first known to be there in 2006. Um, Western Australia and South Australia didn't have any tuliria um, until Western Australia had its first case in 2013 and South Australia had its first case in 2014. So. It's been a disease that has been slowly creeping across the country. So, well, I guess it depends on your perspective. Perhaps it's quickly spreading across the country. Um, the thing to bear in mind, so that there is no confusion here, um, there are other Tuliria species across the world that are exotic to Australia, and they're the ones that we've heard of. Um, East Coast Fever, which is Tuliria parva, and a tropical or Mediterranean Tuliria. Uh, which is Tuliria annulata. Now these Tuliria species behave differently. Um, they're more severe, um, dramatic diseases. Um, but since we've um, now got Aikida, we have a, certainly have an, a Tuliria that is a clinical and and potentially fatal disease. Okay, so if we if we move on to the epidemiology of tuliriosis, and you can see we've got a lovely little tick there because we, it is a tick-borne disease, and the vector's the um, Haemophysalis longicornis tick. Um, the issue is that we are not 100% sure whether or not there could be other vectors. So are there other ticks that could carry tuliria, biting flies, mosquitoes, and lice? Some work was done by Jade Hammer in Victoria and he's shown that mosquitoes and lice um, can actually carry Tuliria orientalis but whether or not they can actually transmit it to cattle is um, the unknown. So that issue is a little bit of a watch this space. Things may change in that area um, over the years as we understand more about um, the disease and how it um, transmits and, and manifests. Peak periods of, of tick activity um, and disease incidence tends to be autumn and spring but there's also um, it's also in the summer as well so really it can go from sort of August to through to April. Um, you can see down here in this in this picture the known distribution 
of um, Haemophysalis long longicornis is on this east coast here and little pocket over in the west coast. So I'll talk a little bit more later about how the ticks moved around. Um, so in endemic areas, so endemic areas meaning areas that have got the ticks that carry the tularia, um, it's mostly calves that are affected because most of the, a lot of the adult cattle will have um, seroconverted and um, they will be immune. So calves, um, as they hit the ground, particularly beef calves that are uh, protected and, and um, nursed in in paddocks, long grasses and near, near forested areas uh, are possibly more at risk. Um, in non-endemic areas, all ages can be affected, but especially the periparturient cows of the immunocompromised cattle, for instance, if you've got BVDV. So um, it is a disease that can be managed with, um, with low stress and bearing in mind that your high-risk animals are your immunocompromised animals. If we have a little bit of a closer look at transmission, the movement of cattle from a non-endemic area, which tends to be inland Australia, to endemic areas, which tend to be our coastal areas, and they, these definitions of what's endemic and non-endemic are quite fluid and they're changing. As cattle move, um, they actually move the, potentially move the disease around. Well, that's at least what's thought to be happening. So movement of, um, and so, so we've, got, we've actually got the movement of cattle from a non-endemic area to an endemic area makes them susceptible to the disease. So a naive animal goes into an area where there's, um, where the disease exists. Or we've got movement of a carrier or infected cattle or ticks. So the cattle don't have to be on the ticks. Sorry, the ticks don't have to be on the cattle. Um, the ticks can actually be moved to an area and um, and then actually set up in an area. But of course, most commonly, the ticks will enter an area via, via cattle that have been infected or infested with the ticks uh, and um, transmit it that way. So it can move, they can bring, infected or carrier animals can bring the disease into a non-endemic area of naive cattle. And this not only introduces tyleria, but well, well, there's a number of layers here. It can it can introduce tyleria to a um, already existing local tick population that previously didn't have tyleria, um, or it can actually f um, introduce ticks to an area that are, usually didn't have ticks, and they, they can actually survive in that area. So, um, and, and this allows for further spread in, across the region. Uh, the other issue we have is that movement of cattle um, has also, well this, this, this is what I was just saying, is that the movement of cattle has also seen the range of habitation of, of the, the tick spread. So um, we also have the issue of the spread via wildlife, particularly deer, and New Zealand have, have a, a belief that hares may be involved in the movement of the disease, of the, of the ticks, sorry, across um, the North Island. A couple of th more things to be um, aware of. The incubation period for Tularia is four to six weeks. So with that in mind, uh, calves under four weeks of age will not um, present with uh, Tularia. And we need to bear that um, period of time in mind when we're introducing stock, naive stock into an um, in endemic area or if we introduce infected animals into a non-endemic area, that there will be a lag phase of four to six weeks before you will actually start to see um, clinical signs or a clinical outbreak. Unfortunately, there is no cross protection between the, the variants. So buffalo has been around for some time, but just because um, a group of animals uh, have buffalo, have Tularia buffalo in, uh, in that or even have been infected with that before, it will not cross protect them against Aikida. Um, and they're persistently uh, subclinical carriers for life. Any animal that gets infected um, has a 
has it for life. So that's how it allow that's how it's allowed to keep um, transmitting and and spreading. Another thing to be in, uh, aware of is that an anim a cow that's that's um, been previously affected can have recrudescence of the disease. It's rare but it is possible because they're sitting there in a subclinical carrier state if they became very immunocompromised it's, it is possible for the disease to return. Okay so if we have a look at um, some of the clinical signs we'd expect to see associated with um, teleriosis we've got um, lethargy and weakness, uh, mortality is uh, it has become more and more evident and, that, and that's how we I guess how the the epidemiologists became aware that we, we had a more virulent strain given the the fatal nature of the disease uh, they often got a fever uh, jaundice that it's often associated with stillbirths and abortions uh, anemia of course and um, a drop in milk production so clearly our cow here it would have a drop in milk production but you can have um, uh, otherwise less severely affected looking animals and their their own their only presentation may be a bit lethargic and a drop in milk production so it can have a whole range of um, presentations um, and and if we have a close look at that um, the diagnostic options we've got when we're trying to decide whether we've got tularia um, so the New Zealanders have developed the field anemia nearest indicator card now this is to help vets cow side decide the severity of the anemia uh, that cattle had in the in the outbreak of um, teleriosis. So we'll just have a look at that card just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's a it's a plastic laminated card and it just uh, gives an idea of the the colour of the the mucous membranes of the vulva and how that correlates to the PCV percentage. It's a fairly, um, I guess, subjective and um, rough measure, but, uh, but maybe a helpful indicator of the severity of disease calcide when you're not able to have a PCV done straight away. Um, I will be giving you a link to um, actually the New Zealand Veterinary Association's website that has quite some quite good resources with regards to teleriosis so you'll be able to access that. Um, okay so when we've got our CBC with um, teleria we're going to see um, a reduction in our PCV and our, our red blood cell count um, and we're going to see variable leukocytosis as well. Uh, it can be uh, the, all, all the parameters can be elevated or they can be normal it's quite variable the response that an individual cow has there with the biochemistry we're going to have uh, hyperbilirubinemia and that can be quite marked um, increases in GLDH and GGT are commonly seen and, and that's thought to be associated with um, the hypoxia of the anemia and uh, hyperbilirubinemia is also being seen if we have a closer look at um, our blood smear, so we're going to see regenerative anemia. Now the teleria um, is actually in the red blood cells, in the red, red blood cells, as I um, showed you earlier. They're long, comma shaped, and tend to have a hollow, wrong, a hollow ring look within the red blood cells. Um, and you, you're not able to distinguish between the variant types on a blood smear. So. Um, Basically what that means is parasitemia with teleria species is not diagnostic of clinical disease. Uh, the teleria orientalis buffalo variant is the benign one, the jatosi is possibly clinical and, and Akita particularly causes clinical disease. So we need to go to um, the next step of PCR to be able to identify whether or not the teleria species we're seeing in our blood smear is in fact um, a virulent one. Uh, parasitemias can range from 1 to 20 percent commonly uh, and the level of parasitemia doesn't necessarily correlate with um, the level of clinical disease. Uh, sensitivity 
with the blood smear is reduced when there's low levels of parasitemia. So that's where PCR comes in. It's a highly sensitive test and there's quantitative PCR available. And that's able to identify buffali, chitose and um, importantly Aikida. So if you are concerned you have telluria, um, you send off a blood smear, if you look at a blood smear yourself and you, you're pretty sure you've got telluria on in the red blood cells in, in a blood smear, then it's really important to send that off to be sure that it's not just buffali that you're seeing in the red blood cells but you do actually have Aikida and that that is causing your clinical, the clinical disease you're seeing. Um, here's some um, pictures of the Tilleria orientalis. The top one is a blood smear from the uh, uh, cow in the WA outbreak. Uh, and uh, here we've got another picture down the bottom of the, the pyroplasms. So the, um, the Tilleria, all the uh, the Tilleria types are called pyroplasms or basically pyroplasm is an organism within the red blood cell so that can be the other parasites, um, red blood cell parasites as well. And so you can see, I'll just point this out, we've got that hollowed ring look, we've got some crescent shaped or comma shaped um, inclusions in the, in, the, in the red blood cells so that's what we're looking for here. But um, as I said earlier, do a blood smear, have a look at it yourself, see what you think and get it confirmed by a pathologist. Okay, coming into treatment, now this is the challenging part of teleriosis. Uh, there is no registered drug option in Australia to, to deal with it. And um, that's different to New Zealand. Uh, Bupavaquone is available in New Zealand. And it's thought to be effective, but significant efficacy um, appears to be inconsistent. Some work was done where um, uh, there was no significant um, in increase in using or increase in, in clinical effect using bupavaquone. However, observations would show that there was um, less clinically severe disease and a better return to production in the early stages um, post treatment. So it does have, um, it, it is believed to be effective. The issue with it, of course, is the withhold period. We've got a 42-day milk withhold. Uh, so for dairy farms, that's a challenging choice to make as to whether to use it, um, and an 18-month meat withhold. Uh, so one of the reasons that oh, I suspect it hasn't been introduced into Australia is the, the meat re residue issue and the withhold periods involved. If we have a look at other options, um, imidacarb dipropionate or imidox is the brand name produced by SIVA. Um, there's anecdotal evidence uh, that it has been effective. So there are clinicians, um, cattle clinicians using imidox and, and they do feel that it has benefit in terms of protecting um, uh, the rest of the herd in an outbreak. And uh, Though there is no um, scientific significant evidence, um, there's been no papers produced to that, that, that show um, significantly that um, imidacarb um, will make a difference. However, uh, in the face of an outbreak, um, it is something that you would probably want to consider using. So the issue being that for um, lactating cows, dairy cows, a permit's needed for its use because it is not supposed to be used in lactating animals. Um, so a permit um, can be can be requested to, to use it at the low dose, um, but uh, for beef, cat, beef cattle we can use it at the high dose and the meat withhold on that's 28 days. So that's, um, that's fairly reasonable to be able to manage to use that. It is just challenging in, in a dairy situation. Oxytetracycline has, has largely been unrewarding. Some people feel it, it works. Um, most people now feel that it really isn't making a difference. It has been used for uh, Tilleria parva and Tilleria annulata post-vaccination. Um, and, that, and that's catching the protozoal schizont stage, which is the preclinical stage. So could it be helpful in preventing further cases in the face of an outbreak? Uh, I suspect the horse has probably bolted by the time you've got an outbreak. It's gone 
past the Shizont stage uh, of the progression of the disease. But it, it's something to, um, to ponder, I suppose. Uh, hello, Figuninone, which I always have trouble saying. Hello, Figuinone. Fuginone. Hello, Fuginone. That's it. Um, that needs to be um, 10 times uh, the, a dose to, for treating coccidiosis. Uh, and, and a similar dose would be required for tularia. And at that dose, it causes esophageal, esophageal ulceration. So it's just really not a viable option. Uh, really, it, look, the only only drug that currently most people are saying is worth having, a, worth using is um, is the imidacarb. Uh, blood transfusions also seem to be um, the best way through uh, trying to deal, trying to keep. Um, you know, get an animal to recover. So blood transfusions are advocated in animals with a PCV less than 15. And an animal should should pretty much be in, in full recovery by two to three weeks um, post the inc the event. The, um, and it, it, in fact, a lot of uh, vets are tending to go towards good management, quiet management of the cattle and blood transfusions and monitoring the herd. Um, and, and, and transfusing as needed uh, as, as a better way forward in terms of managing the disease and some vets in New Zealand are actually doing that in preference to um, using bupavaquone uh, due to its, its withhold issues so it just depends on the um, severity of the outbreak and that's going to have that's going to depend a bit on whether you're in an in, endemic marginal or or um, non-endemic area. So if we just have a closer look at blood transfusions, there's a great description um, at the link that I've got at the bottom of the, the page there. Uh, but um, just a brief rundown. With our recipient, we want to consider administering antihistamine in case we get a um, transfusion reaction. Uh, we want to have a, our donor actually have a PCV and a blood smear, if possible, possible done before the transfusion. Of course, a blood smear is not always possible. Um, but um, uh, potentially if a PCV can be done of sorts then, then that helps you be sure that the animal you've chosen out of the herd it doesn't also, isn't also suffering from tuliriasis. Um, consider uh, light sedation with xylazine uh, to make the whole transfusion process a little bit um, easier for everyone. Uh, and basically you can take four to five litres from the donor cow and um, place it into a container and, and commonly people are using things like um, pressure sprays uh, and, and what's already in that container is 100 mils per litre of blood that you're planning to collect um, of a 3.8% sodium citrate solution. As you can see there, that means you put 38 grams of sodium citrate into one litre of Hartmann's. So you've actually got about four to 500 mils of your sodium citrate solution in the container and you collect the blood and that, that's your anticoagulant to keep the blood um, in the ideal um, consistency for, um, for delivering to the recipient. Once you've collected the blood from the donor, uh, consider giving, giving her um, some oxytetracycline, um, but that may not always be necessary. Once we've got to the point of delivering, we're going to the recipient is going. We're going to administer the blood via a 14 gauge, um, giving set and pressure pressure sprayer um, setup that that um, you can create. Or it, certainly in the picture there, they're not using a pressure sprayer. They're using a, a blood collection container, and that's fine too. I th the benefit of the the sprayer is that you can actually administer it a little bit more quickly. But um, we want to start off slowly in delivering the blood and then uh, the rest of it over five to ten minutes is usually all that's required. So further treatment, really it's about quiet management of all cattle. Um, they're not to push the cows hard, they need to be moved around slowly. Dairy cows can be dropped back to once a day milking or to cease milking in severe cases. Uh, the main thing is not, it's important not to stress the cows because that will um, accelerate the progression of the disease. Uh, basically TLC, so easy access to feed, water and shelter 
is, um, is all part of the process of managing this disease in, in the face of an outbreak. The other thing to consider is screening the rest of the herd for anemia, um, looking at the mucous membranes and, and any that you feel are affected, treat as needed or you could um, consider blanket treating the herd with imidazole. In Australia it would be imidazole, in New Zealand um, bupavacrone could be used on a, on a needs basis. There has been some suggestion that Baycox and calves may help and, and perhaps this is in the preclinical stage of the disease development or even even um, beyond that but there, there is no evidence out there currently um, to support this, this idea um, but I um, did hear it um, discussed amongst some um, some pathologists and practitioners at uh, at the recent PANPAC Teleria workshop. So that is definitely a watch this space um, kind of issue. Uh, if we actually look at then the bigger picture of management, we need to think about movement of cattle and, and the movement of cattle from non-endemic to endemic areas and vice versa is the high risk. And particularly if we're moving cattle in the periparturian period. So um, we need to think about what's happening when we're moving cattle from the coast to inland and vice versa. If the movement must occur, only transport naive animals into an endemic area outside the periparturian period. Now infection may still occur, but it um, we should happen with a reduced severity. Uh, and we also don't want to move animals from an endemic area into a marginal or non-endemic area in the periparturian period for the, for the home stock that are there. Um, and I guess, you know, trying to avoid spring, autumn and, and possibly summer as well. But that's very difficult and it's very difficult for all year round and split calving dairy herds. It's just about being aware of how the, um, the activity of the ticks, the activity of the, um, of the Tileria and how it can move from place to place and when the high risk periods are. So healthy non-stressed herds should have lower prevalence of clinical disease. If we, if we manage that well, the impact will be less in, in, in the face of an outbreak. Other management issues to consider are um, endemic areas, sorry, in endemic areas, re rearing calves in lower tick infestation areas, e.g. in a shed, hilltop paddocks away from forested areas. There's no um, hard and fast evidence that this will make a, dis a difference, but th this is speculated to, to perhaps help. We have to think about the implications for sale of infected cattle. Uh, because litigation is always a possibility and you do need to be aware that out-of-court settlements have already occurred in cases of um, uh, teleriosis. So uh, what about the ticks? Well, acaricides could help rein in the, the tick populations, but um, it won't actually control them. It might reduce ticks where the ticks are already in, in low numbers, so it may be helpful, but it's not going to be a, be a really um, strong arm in, in managing the the progression or the, the, the spread and the impact of the disease. Um, vaccines, well they're being researched um, but they're still a long way off so we've still got to manage this without um, prevention at this stage uh, the best way we can. And there's also a bit of an unknown future on the impact on trade barriers. Teleria are, has been, um, Teleria orientalis has been listed as an, an OEI disease um, so at this stage, uh, there's there's no issue, but um, it's just unknown what future impacts it may have. So I guess, in summary, there's still much that we need to understand about how to deal with Tilleria orientalis, but hopefully uh, this podcast has helped you not only um, think through anemia, jaundice and red urine, but also get a, a, a bigger picture on, on how to... Uh, think through and deal with teleriosis. I have the list of references there for you if anybody would like to do some further reading um, and uh, I hope that you've all enjoyed the podcast and don't forget that the discussion forum it will be open uh, after this is finished so often uh, the more we learn the more questions we have so no doubt um, 
there'll be some questions there and I look forward to having discussion with you all. Thanks very much.